This is Sue Jackson of the Book by Book blog, and I am here today with my July reading wrap up. Now, um, if you've seen any of my other videos this summer, you know that summer for me means the big book summer reading challenge. And I was fully into that in July. Um, this is a challenge that I host every summer. Anyone can join in. Um, the idea is to read bigger books that you might not normally have time for. Um, a big book is defined as anything 400 or more pages and you set your own goals. Personally, I like to get a stack, go through my shelves and find all the bigger books and make a stack at the beginning of the summer. I don't usually get through all of them, but I like having options. So this was definitely a month of big books, um, beginning with the Air You Breathe by Francis DuPont Peebles. Um, this is historical fiction. It is set in Brazil in the 1930s, and I absolutely loved this novel. It was really different than anything I've ever read before, and I'm not sure I've ever read a book set in Brazil before, um, so I learned a lot, too. Um, so this novel is about the very unique friendship, the very intense friendship between two women um, who meet when they're just small girls. So when they're just nine years old, um, Grassa, who is the uh, little miss of a sugar plantation, moves to the plantation with her family to take over running it. Dorish, the other nine-year-old girl, um, is a kitchen servant. And the other servants consider her pretty much the lowest of them all because she's an orphan and she's very young. Um, so she's never really known love or affection or even just the freedom of childhood play. So when Grassa's family moves in, um, Grass has been brought up in a very wealthy, pampered environment. Uh, she's a little spoiled. So when she sees the kitchen girl who looks about her age, she demands that she be allowed to play with her. So her mother acquiesces and gives Dorish some time off from the kitchen so that she can play with Grassa. So the two become very close friends. They run all over the plantation together. Um, Grassa's never really spent much time outdoors, so Dorish introduces her to climbing trees and swimming in the river and things like that. And um, Grassa introduces Dorish to wonderful things like reading and music and school. Um, she ends up joining her in her lessons. So the two girls are very close. And then Grassa's mother takes them to a concert in a nearby city and then buys a record player. And the two girls both become enamored with music. And they dream of being singers like the ones they hear on the radio. As teens, the two girls run off to Rio in pursuit of their dreams of becoming musical stars and singers. And of course, they run into a lot of challenges. Um, they do manage to get jobs and a rundown little apartment in the poorest section of Rio, um, but they do gradually begin to make way with their dreams of getting into music. Um, the thing is, they are never really able to completely shed their original roles. They're never really able um, to have an equal relationship because of where they come from. So it's fascinating about their relationship um, but also about their rise to eventual stardom. So the novel delves into issues of race, of class. Um, there's a lot of history in it because it begins in the 30s and moves forward, both in Brazil and in the U.S. Um, the novel kind of goes back and forth in time. So there are some present day sections that are narrated by Dorish as an elderly woman in Miami. And then there are the sections in the past as they grow up together, run away together and try to become singers. Um, it's just a wonderful novel. 
and music is at the center of it and music that I was completely unfamiliar with. So, I mean, I loved reading it. I, I wish there had been some kind of audio accompaniment so I could have heard these mute, these songs and this particular style of music. There are song lyrics throughout the book, um, beginning each section. Um, and there's, there are detailed descriptions of the type of music they play, but I would love to have heard it for myself. So anyway, that is The Air You Breathe by Frances DuPont Peebles, um, a historical novel about a women's friendship that I really, really enjoyed. And next up was another big book, um, Blackout by Connie Willis. Connie Willis has become a favorite author for both my husband and me. Um, she writes, this book is a part of her Oxford time travel series, which it's kind of loosely a series um, with the exception of this book, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so you can read them mostly in any order, um, but they all center around the same idea. So in the Oxford time travel series, it's set in the near future, I think like around 2060, um, in Oxford. And um, the technology for time travel has become pretty standard and, and is used by historians at Oxford to travel back in time to um, witness history firsthand. So it's kind of like there are all these grad students and instead of researching in the library, well, they're doing some of that, but then they're also actually going back to the time and place they're studying to, to witness it firsthand. Now, as in all time travel um, novels, they're not supposed to interfere at all or change anything. And according to the, the rules around time travel in this book, they're not supposed to be able to change anything. So um, just briefly, last summer um, for Big Book Summer 2020, my husband and I both read Doomsday Book by Connie Willis, and it turned out to be a favorite book of all time for both of us. Um, in this one, a historian went back to the 1300s and got stuck there. So fascinating and really good. So Blackout, the one that I just finished, um, takes place about four years after Doomsday Book ended. So the time travel program with the historians has really ramped up in that time to the point where the technicians who are in charge of the, the technical side of making the time travel happen are really overwhelmed and can barely even keep the schedule straight for who's going back to where and when, and when they're supposed to come back, etc. So the idea here, as you can tell from the cover, it is set entirely during World War II, um, other than the future parts. And um, there are a lot of historians from Oxford traveling back to different times and places during World War II in England. So at the beginning of the book, there's a woman who's in northern England in one of the rural areas where children were evacuated to, witnessing and actually taking part in the evacuation of children from London. Um, there's a young male grad student who is posing as an American reporter in Dover, and he's there to witness the evacuation um, from Dunkirk of the British soldiers by regular citizens who just, you know, got in the water with their boats and, and helped rescue people. So he's there to witness that from the Dover side of things. Um, there's a woman who has already visited VE Day in London, and now she's been sent back to the beginning of the Blitz in London. So she's posing as a shop girl She's working in one of the department stores, and they know from history which stores got hit and which didn't. So she's trying to stay safe. She's rented an apartment, again, in a building that historically was not hit. And she's, um, 
She's there to witness how ordinary British citizens responded to the Blitz. So all these different things are going on at once. And at the beginning, it jumps around a little bit from, from one person and place to another. Um, but this time, things start to go wrong with the technology. The historians who are due to go back to Oxford for a check-in find that they can't and it kind of spirals out of control. So there is, just like with um, Doomsday Book, there is a huge amount of suspense here, um, both from what's going on at that point in history, um, as well as from not being able to get back to their own time. So there's a lot of suspense. It's a very gripping story. But Connie Willis is also a wonderful writer. Her characters are three-dimensional. You really come to care about them. Um, her writing's just magnificent. So highly recommend Blackout. It was excellent, just like Connie Willis's other novels. My only complaint, and when I was partway through, another book blogger uh, warned me of this, so I did get a little warning, but there is nothing on the cover or the back to indicate that this is part one of two books, but it is. <laughs> so right in the middle of the action, you know, you're wondering what's going to happen next. And the last page says, for the riveting conclusion to Blackout, be sure not to miss Connie Willis's All Clear. So that is a real bummer <laughs> when you're reading through this suspenseful novel and all of a sudden it just ends and you find out that the rest of the story is in another book. So I was very disappointed in that. Like I said, I had a little bit of forewarning. So I'm warning you, this is an excellent book. Um, I highly recommend it. But get both of them ahead of time so that you don't have to wait to read the conclusion. I will definitely be reading All Clear to find out what happens next. Um, and more of Connie Willis's novels as well. She's just great. So in between the big books last month, I did squeeze in a smaller book. Um, this is a middle grade graphic novel called Allergic by Megan Wagner Lloyd with illustrations by Michelle Me Nutter. And it was excellent. Um, it actually had a lot more depth than I expected from it. So as you can probably tell just from the cover, it's about this girl, Maggie, and for her 10th birthday, her parents have promised she can pick out a puppy. Now Maggie has always wanted a pet. She's always wanted a dog. She's really excited about this. And on the day of her birthday, her family heads off to the animal shelter. She finds a puppy that seems to love her just as much as she loves him. And then, as you can see on the cover, she starts breaking out in hives and her face starts to swell up and they end up in the, in the ER that day. Um, Maggie has to go see an allergist who confirms that it's not just dogs. She is severely allergic to anything with fur or feathers. So that leaves out a lot of pets. Um, what I liked about this is it doesn't take the situation lightly. Um, it really gets into how devastated Maggie is by this and all the different ways that it affects her life. Um, it's not just that she can't get the dog she's always wanted. It affects some things at school as well. So at the same time that Maggie's going through all this with the allergies, she is also um, trying to find a good picture here. She is also starting out at a new school. That's her and her family going to the animal shelter. So she's also starting at a brand new school um, she feels very left out at the beginning. She doesn't know anyone there. Um, but then things gradually improve. She's got a new next door neighbor named Claire, who ends up being her best friend, um, although they do have a falling out at one point. She meets another boy in her grade 
who is um, who also has allergies, food allergies, that affect him in a lot of ways. And the two of them kind of bond over that. And she doesn't feel quite alone and as as alone anymore. Um, the novel, though, is not just about allergies. It's also about friendship, about siblings. Maggie has younger twin brothers, and her mother is expecting a baby any day now. So Maggie's really unsure how she's going to fit into this new family dynamic. So I really enjoyed it. Um, here's another set of pictures. You can see um, the illustrator uses very colorful, um, realistic drawings that I felt really helped to tell the story. So um, this is for middle grade and the title is Allergic. Excellent graphic novel for middle graders. Finally, I always have an audiobook going. And of course, this summer, they're big books. So um, in July, I finished listening to Boy Swallows Universe by Trent Dalton. Um, this was an unusual audiobook, but I really ended up enjoying it. It's set in Australia and features a 12-year-old boy named Eli. Um, now, Eli has an unusual and difficult life. His mother and stepfather are heroin dealers, caught up with a pretty bad criminal element in their town. His older brother, um, Gus, is mute, doesn't speak, and Eli's best friend is, and his babysitter for a long time, is an elderly ex Khan named Slim, um, who is best known for his multiple prison breaks. In fact, at the beginning of the novel, there's a newspaper article about his notorious <laughs> reputation. So this is who Eli is hanging out with. Um, and Slim encourages him to write letters to some of his buddies who are still in prison. Um, so this is a very unusual life for a boy. And clearly things are not easy for Eli and Gus. They have a lot of challenges to overcome here. Um, what I've just described is the way things are at the beginning of the novel, they get a lot worse um, for his parents, for him, for everyone involved. But Eli has learned a lot from his friend Slim. Um, he's very smart and very determined. Uh, he has a dream of becoming a news reporter himself. And the woman who wrote Slim's profile in the newspaper is kind of his hero. He wants to be just like her. Um, right now, those dreams seem very far away, but the novel, you know, makes progress and it comes to a very satisfying conclusion. So it's warm and it's funny and unique, and I, I really enjoyed it. So that's Boy Swallows Universe by Trent Dalton. Um, and that was it for me because it was big books. I didn't get through a lot of quantity, but plenty of quality last month. Uh, it would be hard. It's hard to choose a favorite because I really enjoyed all of these. Um, really loved the air you breathe, especially, but if I have to choose a favorite, I would say it's blackout. Um, like I said, these books are just so good, and she's such a great writer, and I can't wait to read part two, all clear. So that's probably my favorite. So what did you read in July, and what was your favorite book last month? Let me know in the comments down below. I love to hear about what you're reading. And while you're at it, you can click the thumbs up to like this video and subscribe.